Good morning. I'm Walt Bartman, and I'm the founder and director of the Owl Barn Studio at Con Echo. We're doing a series of instructor interviews uh, so that you'll get to know uh, the instructors uh, of the Owl Barn Studio. We have a new instructor, actually someone who I've known for many years, uh, who uh, has joined our faculty, and we're really um, proud to have him, and his name is Kevin Berlin. Uh, he comes from Potomac, Maryland, but he's an internationally known artist and uh, has been working for you know, close to 40 years, I believe, um, producing artwork. So I think the uh, thing I wanna do this morning is to say, hi, uh, Kevin, how are you? Buongiorno. Yeah, it's great to, great to hear from you. Um, you're in uh, Italy right now. It's true, I am quarantined zone red in Florence, Italy. Yeah, this is a. Um, it's it's interesting that on Zoom we can really communicate very easily back and forth. Uh, it seems like you're right next door, actually. All right, and so you're going to be teaching at the Yellow Barn. Um, your uh, uh, the Zoom classes really make it so that we can, uh, you know, have the uh, uh, the instructors work closely with the students no matter where they are. So I think that this is great to to have you. My experience with Kevin is that I was his uh, high school teacher and, um, you know, having him now return and be on the faculty is a real honor to me because I think that uh, he brings a lot of uh, experience and uh, uh, he is an internationally known artist. He shows all over the world. So I think that, you know, he brings to uh, the students who are going to be taking his class a really in-depth understanding of uh, what it is to be an internationally known artist. Um, to get, give you a little background in what uh, uh, Kevin has achieved, first of all, when he was studying with me at uh, Glen Echo, uh, or not at Glen Echo, but at uh, Walt Whitman High School, uh, he um, was what is known as a presidential scholar. He was honored, honored by Ronald Reagan, and uh, he received a gold medallion, which amazed, uh, what it, it did was to, uh, it was an honor that was given to the elite of the country, both in the arts and in the academics. And there are very few students uh, that are chosen each year. Matter of fact, sometimes only two in the arts. And I think that uh, give you an idea that Kevin really achieved a, a, you know, a, a level uh, with his work, even when he was young. Um, he graduated from Yale University. He went on to uh, study at the Slade School of Fine Arts in London. Um, he's been in the New York Times and the Miami Herald and USA Today uh, and on Tokyo Television and BBC Radio. Uh, in collections, he has worked with Kim Bas Basinger, uh, Luciano Pavarotti, Bill and Hillary Clinton, President George W. Bush and Buzz Aldrin. So now I'm going to ask you, uh, Kevin, can you speak a little bit about yourself and uh, how you started? Yes. Uh, first, I'd mentioned that I am quarantined here in Italy, Code Red. Um, you might remember the first time that I came to Italy, it was with a Italy and Greece trip at Walt Whitman High School, and you were the fearless leader. Uh, I can remember being here more than probably 35 years ago. I remember going into the Academia and seeing Michelangelo's David for the first time. And not just life-changing in the usual sense, but I was so in awe of that sculpture that I actually couldn't draw it in my sketchbook. And that's something that never happened before. I just stared and looked. And a couple of years ago, I decided to come back and learn the Italian language and surround myself with uh, masterpieces and try a little bit of La Dolce Vita. And of course, uh, 2020, very unusual year, a time for a reset, a time to rethink things. And when you asked if I would teach a class, my answer is yes, let's do it. And what classes are you teaching? Uh, there's a still life class called a still life can be, oh, so much more. Uh, and the general idea is that the possibilities of still life are much, much, much uh, more unlimited often than people think. And I believe that if you can approach a still life uh, with, uh, with desire and imagination that you can come up with things that will really surprise yourself. And I think a still life uh, 
uh, just like it did back in the the days when uh, Van Gogh was painting some old shoes. I think a still life, even the most simple subject, can change the world. Mm -hmm. You're um, uh, and the other class that you're teaching. Uh, the second class is self portrait, in case you don't have anyone to paint, and portrait. And for most of my life, I, my main theme has been painting um, about what people are thinking, but they're afraid to say. And because we're people, we're very interested in painting about other people. So I remember studying at the Corcoran School of Art when I was 12, painting nudes. Uh, my work had involved nudes, still life, uh, and a lot of self-portraits way back then. And I think that the best way to talk about people is to paint about them. And so I think that it's a, a great way to start. I think that no matter how abstract the world gets, there'll still be an interest in painting people. And uh, both of your courses, are they for all levels of students? Uh, I think the minimum is, is 13, but the general idea is I'll take anybody who has a desire, who really wants to uh, learn something new and maybe get a, a different perspective. So uh, anywhere from a beginner to somebody who's been painting their whole life and just wants to uh, uh, reset or refresh a little bit and share some ideas. Well, I think for, you know, for students looking for a, a course that really is inspiring, there's no doubt uh, the years that I've worked with Kevin, that he's an inspiring uh, person and an artist. And I want you to speak a little bit about growing up in Potomac and how you evolved into uh, taking art classes and uh, you know some of the influences on you, perhaps. Um, you know, I know your parents have a, a big effect on uh, the way you look at things. And I, and I feel, uh, you know, I've taught uh, uh, two other uh, siblings of yours and uh, they've all also been incredibly uh, inspired uh, people and, and coming to the arts. So maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Well, uh, uh, regarding my parents, I have to say that I, when I grew up, I didn't have my own bedroom. I shared with my big brother, but uh, any art supplies I wanted, as long as I didn't waste them, I could I could go out and buy even cadmium red. Uh, but painting always came very easy to me since I was very, very little. I, I remember at Capitol Hill Day School in Washington, I, I won my first uh, prize, which I guess made me a professional. I, I won a check for a dollar painting a picture of an Indian. Um, and I went on to win a lot of national poster contests and things and eventually started painting uh, at the Corcoran on the weekends. And uh, it was just something that uh, I never thought about. I always thought I would be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. I never imagined you could do something that you love. Uh, I remember I used to take at Pyle Junior High School, which some local people might be familiar with. Um, uh, I remember I used to have a class with Mr. Champagne. And that's when I painted my first black and white painting. My paintings now are mostly known as uh, black and white paintings with a little bit of color. I made a copy of the Mona Lisa on cardboard. And I remember being very surprised and very proud of how well it had come out um, because uh, my teacher, Mr. Champagne, put it up in the window so that people walking down the halls of the pile could see it. And I remember when I just finished it, Mr. Champagne came over, patted me on the shoulder and he said, Kevin, my boy, you should have taken music. And of course, I didn't realize he was joking at the time. Uh, and um, eventually I just uh, followed, followed my dreams. I, I think the difference between me and any other kid and anybody out there is that while a lot of kids stop painting and they stop drawing, you know, when they're five or six or seven, they move on to skateboards and baseball and things like that. I just kept going. Yeah, the um, your parents' house is full of artwork, and a lot of it is yours that uh, hangs in there. And it's always fun to go in and see what you've done. Uh, I, knowing Kevin, the years that I've worked with him, uh, you know, he's uh, always come up with great ideas. He's a, he's an idea person, and there's no doubt when you look at his work and uh, that you'll see that. But the um, thing is that it was 1983 that you graduated from all in the high school. And that was quite a group of uh, young artists in that group. I think um, you were one of the ones that really stood out, especially since you were my second presidential scholar, I believe. And I think the, um, 
thing about that is that you went on to uh, really uh, achieve, achieve a lot. And I, I believe, you know, when we look at the, um, the work, you know, um, it's in a lot of different collections all over the world. So maybe you can speak about that. Well, I, I think that one of the really obvious things is, and I've always felt this, that the idea comes first. First, you have to know what you want to say, what you want to talk about. And almost all of my work is really about the idea of, uh, of starting a conversation about important social issues. Um, while it seems like we all have a lot of differences, we also have a lot of things in common. For example, we all want to be loved. We all want to have friends. We all want to uh, look good. We all want to build something and watch it grow and be part of the future. I think we all want to live in a beautiful place. And a lot of these things that we have in common are the basis for coming up with ideas. Um, some of my paintings are about the fact that lions uh, and tigers are going extinct or about uh, whether uh, social media, like a cell phone, is being used as well as it could. Um, and I think it's what's very important is to understand that an artist has a limited role. There's only so much that we artists can do. Um, the artist is, I, you're probably familiar with the painting, the 3rd of, eight, eight, uh, 3rd of May, 1808 by Goya. Mm -hmm. It's a painting depicting a firing squad. And what's very curious about this painting is that you understand when you look at the people in the painting, you understand the point of view of both the people doing the shooting and the people that are being lined up to be shot. And a great painting does that. It doesn't tell you which side to be on. It, a artist will not solve any problems. Um, I won't tell you what's right or wrong. I won't tell you what's good or bad or just simply the very best work will create some mystery and start a conversation. And that's what I aim for in all of my pieces is to begin a, a conversation. Well, and you know, the, a lot of your pieces you, you've shown all over the world. Maybe you'll talk a little bit about that, but also talk about some of the people who've collected your work and maybe some of the stories uh, that you can share with us. Um, well, I've had recent shows are in London. I've had shows in uh, Shanghai, uh, of course, in Florence. I had a, a solo show at Aqua Art Miami and also Art New York, just in, uh, just in New York. Um, one of the most recent themes, I've basically been working on three different uh, main themes. Um, uh, one is uh, painting. Uh, where my main themes are party scenes and the classical ballet. Uh, the second theme is still life, which includes everything from uh, tomatoes and Nutella to, uh, to uh, you know, other kind of things that can happen while you're painting a still life. Um, and the third uh, thing which is uh, important is the sculpture. And I work in sculpture as well and performance art. So it's painting, sculpture, and performance art. Um, th those have been the main themes. And then the, the people that have collected your work? Um, I was lucky enough to, when I worked on a series of paintings called Heroes, I got to meet a number of my personal heroes, which included my three-year-old nephew, uh, included Luciano Pavarotti posed for a sculpture, Anastasia Valachkova, who is one of the most known uh, classical ballet dancers in the world at the time. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, who was the second man to uh, walk on the moon. As a matter of fact, when I first met Buzz to pose for a portrait, he uh, looked at his wife and he looked at me and he said, what do you want to paint? What do you want to sculpt me for? Why don't you sculpt Neil Armstrong? <laughs> and of course, I thought he was joking. And his wife said, now Buzz, uh, and, uh, and of course I said, well, you made it to the moon. I think that's something uh, very worthy to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, You've had some shows in, in uh, Southampton and, uh, um, and there are some really interesting shows that I remember. I got to see the one made in China. Um, you wanna speak about that one? Oh, I could mention that. I've, I've tried when I talk about important social issues, I started to notice uh, uh, that that more and more it's, it's less important to make a work by hand. And I've always been interested in the idea 
that you could create something with your own hands, that you could use uh, some paint and a brush uh, or some clay uh, and build something. But of course, if you follow the, uh, the art market and the uh, trends in the world in terms of what's considered art, you don't actually have to paint, some, paint something anymore. You don't have to be able to interpret what you look at. And I know that you do the same thing that you, uh, you like to you know, set up some flowers in a vase, or you like to go to some windy or snowy location and, and, and have something to say or respond to what you're looking at. And that, that particular show made in China, I was responding to an email I received that basically said that, uh, that someone in China could paint all my pictures for me and I would never have to lift up a brush again. And at the moment that seemed like not a bad idea. And of course, uh, I tried it. Um, <laughs> but but as as we all know, if you really love painting and sculpture, you love uh, the actual experience of painting, of moving the paint around, or of uh, welding the metal together, and things like that. And the actual authenticity, the feeling of being at first hand and getting experience. If I want to paint a party. I'll paint it, I want to have seen someone crying on a cell phone at the edge of the door. I want to see someone uh, drunk propositioning somebody that they should not even be talking to. I want to see somebody else uh, laughing or crying or falling in love or, all of, or betraying someone else or all the things that can happen in a Shakespeare theater production. You can see all that in real life. And if I put in my painting, I usually want to see it first. And so I've spent a lot of time traveling to some very far away places for authenticity. Um, for example, in the year uh, 2003, I, did, I woke up one morning and decided to move to Russia and paint ballerinas because of the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg. And it was also, uh, of course, is the home of the Kirov Ballet, which Tchaikovsky wrote, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty and the Nutcracker, for that theater. I wanted to be at that theater and see those dancers. Um, when I started to realize uh, a few years later that tigers were going extinct, um, right as we're talking, tigers are going extinct. It hasn't stopped. Um, I decided that the best thing to do was to join the Ukrainian National Circus and get near some tigers. Now, uh, if you're near a tiger, I think it's almost necessary in order to say something about a tiger, because if you just see them in pictures or watch them on a YouTube video, you're going to have no idea what it's like to have a tiger look you right in the eyes and understand that that tiger understands your prehistoric DNA and you are meat and you will feel every hair go up on the back of your shoulders when he growls and you will know that he would just as soon eat you as not. And that's the kind of beauty, that's the kind of power, that's the kind of magic that a tiger has. And slowly over time, there's gonna be less and less chance to interact with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, such a magnificent, uh, I've run out of adjectives to describe how much I admire tigers. And what's very important is to go to these places, have an authentic experience, and then start to talk about what's going on in our real life. For example, and I think people have discovered this during this pandemic, we all have a tiger nearby. Probably you or I, we might have a tiger in the house. I have a painting called Tiger in the House, and you're asking the question, what happened if a tiger showed up in your living room? But I don't mean necessarily a physical tiger. It could be a metaphor. Maybe you have a relative who drinks too much or uses drugs or is, uh, you know, is really depressed or is doing something else that's damaging to them because they have this powerful, beautiful force inside them that they can't quite control. And I could call that force a tiger. So you can start with any of these one-on-one uh, -on -one authentic experiences and build to a whole array. The Probably my favorite painting in the series is called The Tiger in the Deep Interior of the Mind which was simply a dream about something powerful and beautiful that was very hard to identify. Well, this is, a, you know, when I look at your work, I know the, uh, you know, the career that you've had, and I've seen you go from sunflowers uh, to tigers, you know, to um, 
purses, all right? Uh, you've, you've had a, a, to Nutella, all right? There's, it's very interesting, the different subjects that you've worked with. You've made them all interesting. Now, after that long career right now, and we're talking, I guess, 30 some years of painting, I would think, right? I mean, that's where we are. Um, what it makes you come to teaching now? Well, as I mentioned, you asked me and I'm home. So, uh, but I, I, I'm inspired by the idea. Uh, I'll give you an example. I reread uh, War and Peace sometime in April because I thought this pandemic would be over by summer. Um, it's not. And War and Peace, which is really, uh, you know, it's a thousand something pages by Tolstoy about um, the invasion of, of, of Russia um, by Napoleon. And it asks you a lot of questions about, uh, well, they're the same questions they asked in the movie Blade Runner, which I remember watching when I was at Walt Whitman High School. Who are we? Where do we come from? How long have we got? Um, is the person in your love with uh, a robot or a real person? What's what the nature of things? These are big, big questions. And I think most of us have been in some kind of a personal crisis, a family crisis or some other crisis. We've had a lot of time for crises because in the last several months, we haven't been as busy. Um, you know, bless anybody who has been in any crises. Um, and so I think it's maybe a good time to, to, to reread War and Peace, to re-ask these questions. And there is nothing I think that's gonna give you a second chance as much as uh, turning the table 180 degrees from being uh, a student so long ago to being a teacher. Because I think as a teacher, you're going to have to ask yourself, you know, who are we? Um, how long have we got? And what do we have to say? And I'd say the single most important thing that, that I would uh, stress for my teaching is simply this. Um, I interviewed a number of 10 year old students at the Vaganova Academy in Russia. I had an interpreter. Um, they were all students considered the hope of the Academy, the director of, of the Academy. Um, 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 organized this for me. And these 10 year old students who are training for one of the best, if not the best ballet companies in the world, 10 year olds, boys and girls, I asked them the question, what would it take to be a great ballet dancer? And it's the same question, what would it take to be a great painter? Or what would it take to be a great singer? Or what would it take to be a great lawyer? Or what would it take to be a great baker? Doesn't matter the subject. And a number of them said the exact same words. And the words were very simple. They said, you must want and strive to be a great dancer. And I believe that if you want to make a great painting, whether it's a tomato or whether it's a, you know, a dozen figure masterpiece, um, uh, you have to want it, you have to strive. And I don't think that that's a, a punishment or a torture. I think it's just part of what we do. I think Matisse was 89 years old and he never ran out of things to draw. There's always more. Heaven knows how old uh, Michelangelo was when he stopped drawing and probably the last uh, 10 minutes in the last breath. Um, we have to want and strive to be better artists. And I think that for myself personally, as entirely personal, I think that teaching might open a few doors that I've left closed because I've been too busy um, to help remind me through the eyes of a student, what do I want and strive for? Why do I want to be here? Why do I want to paint? And it's something autonomic. It's not something you spend your time thinking about. It's just something that you are going to do. Yeah, this is a, you know, it's an important part uh, from my point of view when someone like you has had the experience that you've had to be able to pass it on to other generations of, of students and see what they can do with uh, the ideas that you've, you know, you've put together through your life that you can influence them by. I think that the, you know, you're, you're really uh, at a stage in your career where, you know, when we look at the uh, um, Leonardo da Vinci's or we look at the Rembrandt's, they did teach, they did uh, bring, uh, you know, ideas to their students. And I think the um, uh, the key here is, uh, you know, if anything, 
you know, when we have someone like you with the experience that you have, uh, it really makes a difference. And for students, I think you should really seriously consider it because, you know, taking a course like with uh, Kevin, particularly because of his experience. Let me ask you another question, just dealing with teaching before we go on to your artwork, and that is, what do you expect from your students? What do you want them to achieve? I think I've answered that a little bit. I want them to want and strive to uh, become better at what they love. Okay, so um, how, would you, how would you go about doing that? Okay, well, the... my, my strategy is very, very simple. Uh, and it's based, I had a professor at Yale University named Bernard Chait, uh, a great, great teacher. And he said, the very first class, and he was a very uh, Boston uh, gentleman, very, uh, a little bit severe, very serious. And he said, you know, I can have you painting like Matisse in six months. I can have you painting like Picasso in a year. You can paint like Raphael in, I don't know, two years. And I'll have you painting like Michelangelo in four years. But I don't want you to paint like them. You are not them. They are from a specific time with a specific philosophy and a specific group of materials and a certain group of patrons, whether it was churches. And, and it was a time when there was no, in the Renaissance, there wasn't even the concept of latitude. Um, I'm sorry, longitude didn't exist during the Renaissance. Um, there was no watch you could cross the ocean with. Nobody even knew until Portugal came along and decided to get to the spice route. You didn't know you could sail from Europe to to Indonesia, it was a different, different, different time. So what's the point of painting like someone from another time? So what I would like is the students to just be yourself. And part of uh, painting like you is to identify your strengths. And I know that's something that you've always encouraged um, with your students. If you're great at color, I would like you to push it, be, become a colorist. If you make your work abstract, I want your work to get so abstract that I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. If your work is, uh, if you are great at figure drawings or you have a sense of line or composition or you have a certain kind of uh, originality about your, uh, your perspective or if you make all your paintings upside down or you only paint in purple or whatever it is, um, I want you to, to focus on what you do. So in the classes, not only uh, encourage all levels, but I'd like, we will work with some new materials and explore that, but I would really like to focus on what materials you already know best. Because I don't want you to worry too much about, well, how, do I, how much water do I add to my gouache? I want you more worried about, um, you know, I'm painting a tomato, does someone want to eat it? Mm -hmm. Well, this is it. And I think, uh, you know, you've answered uh, my questions now. Uh, really, I think anyone listening to this uh, interview is gonna really get a, a really to know you particularly where you're coming from. I'm gonna share the screen now. We're gonna to go to your work, okay? okay. And uh, you can uh, discuss some things, uh, uh, you know, your composition style, whatever that you want, the theme. And, uh, you know, I might ask you some questions, but we'll see, uh, you, you know, have your description of what you've done. So you should be seeing a, um, a PowerPoint here, okay? I'm hoping, all right? Uh, I do. Okay. And what we're gonna do is go to the slideshow and we're gonna start from the beginning. Uh, sometimes we have glitches, so hopefully we don't have any today, but uh, you see your name? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the first piece. Uh, this painting is eight feet tall and it's called the Velvet Rope. And it's based on some experiences I had in New York City uh, going to uh, you know, those famous New York clubs at night. And the most extraordinary thing about working with groups of people is that uh, I like to recreate the experience, the true experience, that when you're in a place that's packed with people, you are going to find that there are all different emotions in the same room. Uh, for example, the woman on the left, maybe she uh, couldn't get into the club. The woman on the, in the front, maybe she could get into any club and maybe she doesn't even want to be there. The, the big man in the middle who was almost seven feet tall, uh, who was an actual bouncer at a club called Halo, who came and modeled for me, used to tell me, 
I'm a big man in a small world. And he basically, if you squint at this painting and make the lights go darker and darker, eventually all you'll see is the two dots in the middle of his jacket because he has to know what's going on. He's the stability behind the velvet rope. It could be a metaphor for life that as you go past the rope, you can see life is gonna be good. You can be laughing and kissing and dancing. Um, the poor guy in the front is uh, with the woman in the green hat. I think he's, uh, he's scared and he doesn't want his, his uh, date to know about it. And other things that happen, for example, on the right, there's a man in a yellow hat. If you look closely in the painting, you can see that he's holding a New York City coffee cup and he's asking for money. That's the homeless man that nobody sees. Even though he's in the picture, he's not part of the picture. And you can tell all these stories. Uh, you can have people look at this painting at different times in their lives for a hundred years and they'll find something different. And that's what I find exciting about these group paintings. And one other thought about them is that surprisingly enough, if you look at paintings historically that have a crowd, you only need five people because the human eye for whatever reason, and magicians know that when they do shows in Las Vegas or even shows up front, is that a human cannot look at more than five to seven things at once. As soon as there's five to seven things, they're just a bunch of things and we lose track. And in this kind of environment, we lose track and it's exciting to lose track, I think. You know, and it's interesting you touched on that, uh, just on inter interject, John Singer Sargent, uh, wouldn't have any more than five major lights in a painting, hmm. all right? Because they would become distractions after that. And I think that uh, interestingly, and I don't want to cut you short on this, but the color, uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about the color uh, that you use in this particular painting. Well, I mentioned that painting of the Mona Lisa when I was in, in first grade. And I find oftentimes that color is used for no particular reason. It's just there. Well, the shirt was white, so I painted it white or it was green or red. And I think we already know it's a painting. A painting is a, it's a basically, it's a piece of cloth with some dried liquid on it. That's it. It's not a, a seven foot tall man. It's not a half dressed woman. It's not a, a zebra striped coat. And so once we already can accept that, it's just a painting. Um, I think that by getting rid of uh, most of the color, it allows you to feel the emotion because ultimately a good painting is gonna make you feel something. People ask, well, what, what is art? Well, basic definition for most agree on is that art is anything that somebody thinks is art. Um, what I'm interested in in these paintings is starting a conversation and talking about a uh, a life, a story, something to think about. And by getting rid of most of the color, I can use a little bit of color either for emotion, because of course colors are tight, are very tied to emotion. And also they can be there for symbolic reasons. Um, because oftentimes a color takes on some kind of, uh, you know, another, another type of meaning like the velvet rope. Is the rope in this painting, if you looked at the bouncer standing behind, it's a red rope. Um, what's what is red? Well, red is what they put on stop signs. Why do they pick red instead of green? Well, red is a lot less neutral. Well, you probably have some better comments about this than me, but red is much less neutral than green. Uh, red jumps right out at you like my, like my sock. See, red, because it wants you to stop. Um, so there's a lot of things, a lot of doors open up when you close the door of using a lot of color. Yeah. And this, you know, is a, a very powerful image for sure. And to start with this, the next one we're going to go to gives people an understanding of the size that you're working with. Right. The previous painting, the Velvet Rope, is the same size as this painting. Um, this painting was painted, I think, in about four hours. Uh, and I saw, I was walking in Soho in New York, and I was walking by a local place called Novecento. It's an Argentinian bar restaurant. And there was a woman outside crying, holding her phone. Um, and I, I asked her if she was okay. And she kind of stopped crying a little bit and she said, yeah. And, and I asked her, would you mind posing in my studio, which was a few blocks away, holding your phone? And she said, sure. Um, and, and it, it turns out that she's a lifelong friend and, um, who I actually saw with her husband in Monterosso, Italy, uh, earlier this year. Um, but I asked her, well, what happened there? Why, why were you crying, if you don't mind me asking? 
And she said, the bastard, I'll kill him. <laughs> which is the title of the painting. And apparently I had witnessed a breakup phone call where this guy, this couldn't even say in person that he wanted to break up with her. And of course she was heartbroken. Um, and that's oil on canvas and it's painted in a very direct way from a specific person, but it's entirely imagination. It's entirely about uh, a simple idea that uh, that's probably happened to all of us at some point, no matter how strong you are, you might get a rejection. Um, and it might not always be the nicest way. Um, I, I've been uh, following uh, Sylvester Stallone on, um, uh, cause I've always admired his movies that are Rocky movie. And one of the things that Sylvester Stallone always said is that um, uh, this world is not all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place. And if you let it, it will beat you to your knees and leave you there permanently. And then he talks about, and this applies to painting when your painting doesn't work out or your teacher says gesso over it, as you used to say, um, it's not how hard you can get hit and it's not about how hard you can hit, it's about that you can keep moving forward. It's about how much you can take and keep moving forward. And we all have these moments, whether they're moments that are, you know, that lead to some uh, you know, e extreme depression or whether they're moments that, well, uh, doesn't bother me. Uh, we all face these things all the time and it's our, our attitude that's going to bring us forward. Um, yeah, we, and yeah. this painting in particular idea was to start a conversation about that. You know, what's interesting is that the subject that you've chosen, it's endless when you think of the theme that you're using, which are individual people and their stories. Mm. You know, that you, uh, that you, uh, and uh, how do you work? Do you work from photos? Do you work from life? How, how is it that you would go about uh, getting the subject for your painting and then how you'd explore it? Well, I usually start with, uh, as I said, try and go to the source. If I want to paint a tomato, I'll walk to the market here in Florence and get a real, you know, Pomodoro Siciliano. I'll, I'll get the real thing in front of me. Usually start with some small sketches in a big sketchbook. Um, I will try to have people uh, uh, model for works. Uh, in general, usually once a week, sometimes less recently, uh, I, do, I do figure drawings. I paint nudes just to kind of keep fit. Just like if you're a marathon runner, you, need a, you can't stop running. You have to keep running just to stay in shape. I try and draw individual portraits. So those would be in gouache. So I do a lot of my studies on paper with gouache and pencil uh, because gouache uh, surprisingly enough, is very similar. You know that from teaching your gouache classes. Gouache is very similar to uh, oil on canvas, uh, especially if you paint in a very direct way like I do. So I work out my ideas on paper. And then, uh, for example, with uh, the ballet, I, I work with 14 uh, dancers, many from the National Opera and Ballet in, in Ukraine, uh, and had them actually pose for different ideas for the painting. And then the same way that Botticelli would have put together the birth of Venus, having his Venus in the middle, he would have to make her hair longer than it was really. He would add in a character on the left that's the wind and another character on the right that's uh, the cold and then someone holding a cloak and then he'd bring in the ocean. But combining various elements using different references, either drawing or, because obviously if someone is crying, it's hard to have them cry for hours that it would take to paint an oil painting because the paintings take anywhere from a couple of hours, sometimes two, three years working on the same painting. I, I haven't worked for, you know, 50 years on a painting like uh, Da Vinci did with the um, Mona Lisa, but um, so process uh, idea, sketches, get to the source, uh, develop them on paper, and then try and execute a big painting. The one thing I can say that even a painting like this, uh, The Bastard, I'll Kill Him, the painting was finished before I started it. The painting was probably finished the moment that I saw uh, this woman crying in front of this restaurant. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I could realize it, but so my paintings are pretty much finished before I start. 
And the actual painting, the applying the paint to the canvas is something that's that's uh, almost an afterthought. But obviously, it's it's a very uh, necessary uh, ingredient to actually, uh, you know, execute the painting so that it can be shared. Yeah, this is this is a, it's good to hear this and see what you've done here. We're going to move on to the next one, um, which I think I remember this as a conversation because you called me one night. <laughs> from Florence uh, to, to talk about this painting as you were working on it. So uh, maybe share with us what this one's about. Well, this painting started with this idea of, of who's in your life and who do you want to be in your life? And, uh, and Walt Disney movies, of course, uh, follow this idea a lot. You know, someday your prince will come and this kind of thing. And it was around... Um, I think it was on Valentine's Day, and I got one of those chocolate Easter eggs they sell at the train station here in Florence. And inside was a little figurine about this tall of Snow White. And I thought, I throw a lot of great parties at my house. How come someone like Snow White never shows up? You know, she's the fairest of them all. Um, and she's been through so much trauma as a child with that mean stepmother of hers, and she, you know, still uh, wants to, you know, take care of her friends, the dwarves, and she's singing even though she has a lot of hard work to do. And wh where is she? So I decided to put her in a painting. Yeah. Um, of course, when this painting was, the, uh, the fellow on the left is uh, one of my friends here in Italy, his, his uncle, who happened to show up at a party. And I thought, well, we need a guy like him in the painting. So I added him in. I've only met the couple people on the left and right for a couple seconds. You can see there's a figure way to the right and you only see part of her face because again, this crowd idea that, that uh, sometimes you only see part of somebody. Sometimes you don't notice they're there. There's two other figures and that's the reason I called you. If you notice, there's a figure from Toy Story up on the top, I think he's an alien. And then there's a, I think there's a creature from Monsters, Inc. over on the left. But what was strange about this painting was when I was working on it, of the 14 paintings that I was finishing for a show in uh, Art Southampton, which was a, a show in, uh, in Long Island, um, my eye kept going out of the painting. Not this way, I don't know how it works on Zoom or that way. But anyway, my eye kept going to the upper right of the painting and leaving. And I couldn't figure out why. And I think I sent you two or three pictures because I was really desperate and the painting had to dry and then I had to get it uh, you know, shipped to America and uh, get it through customs and get it on the wall. And it just wasn't working, but I knew it could be one of the best paintings. And you looked at the painting and in just a moment said what I've already told you, hey, somehow the composition is throwing your eye out of the painting. Uh, and so what I did was I added that Toy Story figure. You can see he's got three eyeballs and some stars up there. And all of a sudden, the painting calmed down and it became this nice, I don't know, it's like a, a triangle, a nice pyramid kind of a composition. And even though the woman on the right is looking out of the painting and the woman on the left is looking out of the painting, um, you're still there to discover that uh, the fairest of them all did show up at your party. Yeah, the, um, uh, you have some very interesting parties and you taught me how to make a martini, which is a uh, vodka martini, which is just pure vodka. So I think I remember that party. We threw in a little olive oil for a dirty one. <laughs> so here we go to the next one. Uh, this is one of the paintings I worked a lot. Last 20 years, I've been working with uh, classical ballet dancers. Um, this was at, the, I was backstage at the uh, Mariinsky Theater, the Kirov Ballet for almost a year back in uh, 2003. I mentioned it was the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg. And this particular painting is called The Fear of Falling. Um, uh, and the, the dancer who uh, posed for this isn't one who was in the original experience. I was, I was in the audience and backstage quite a bit at this, at this theater. I, I probably spent more time backstage than anybody uh, I don't know, in the last hundred years, because the Mariinsky Theater is, uh, is uh, part of the government in Russia. And I'm very much considered, uh, you know, I'm a foreigner, I'm not Russian. And, you know, state secrets are in this theater. But one of the things that's not a state secret, if you sit in the audience, is this uh, moment, and it only happened once, is that a dancer 
came off the stage. I could see it because I was in the, I was near the backstage and she screamed and started crying all at once. And I thought maybe she had broken her leg or something. I'd never seen something like this. And immediately several other dancers rushed and embraced her and were holding her like you see at the end of an Olympic when someone breaks their leg before they hit the finish line. And I didn't know what happened. And I asked several people what happened because I thought some horrible, horrible thing had happened to this dancer. And of course, you need to be afraid of falling in ballet because there are many more parts than dancers. And if you mess up, you lose your job. You wasted your life. You've been doing this since you were 10. Now you're 19, you have a part in the theater and you, you've lost everything. So at any minute you could slip and fall. Um, as it turned out, what had happened was that the, there was a guest conductor who had speeded up the tempo. And if you're not a dancer, you might not be aware that that ballet is very, very, very difficult. Uh, you know, it's Olympic level uh, movements and you're following music. So if the music goes faster than you're expecting, you might not be able to keep up. And if you don't keep up, you're gonna mess up. And she knew, she didn't have a physical illness, but she knew that she had messed up. Um, and that's what this painting is about, is about, uh, uh, most of us aren't classical dancers and don't have the risk of messing up one time and ruining your whole life. You can paint a bad still life and just so over it. But if you're a classical dancer, you don't always have that uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, you've really got to know the dancers particularly, um, uh, which is very interesting because you decided to go to Russia to study them. You didn't go to the New York ballet. Well, the, uh, as I said, I like to go to the source and there's no theater, in my experience, more authentic. Although some say ballet was, uh, was invented in Florence, Italy. There's no place more authentic than the Mariinsky Theater and the Kirov Ballet. That's 200 and uh, well over 200 years of uh, you know, the greatest, uh, you know, the original presentation of some of the greatest uh, ballets, including the Nutcracker, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this particular painting is called Between Acts, and it's a group of dancers um, at the Ukrainian National Theater backstage. Um, it was posed for from life and also some reference photos. And what intrigued me about it is how different everyone's feeling, uh, but they're doing the same performance. They go together, they're joined together for a moment, and they are absolutely in union as one creating this incredible emotion for the spectators, but they've all got personal things going on. Um, and these are all things that we're more familiar with on Instagram, but this painting I think was painted in 2000 and maybe 12 or 13, something like that. Um, and at that time, people weren't looking on social media. You never saw that a ballerina had a red purse. Um, or if they had some uh, problem with their, if they went to visit the beach or if they had a problem with, uh, I don't know, uh, their shoe, you know, it wasn't publicized. It was completely secret. These were all state secrets. Mm -hmm. So this painting was just about a chance to get into the, get into the place where these things are going on. And, and backstage is where it all happens because that's not the public uh, presentation. That's not what you're supposed to see. The dancers want you to see the beautiful story that they're portraying. They don't want to see that they were crying before they started or, uh, you know, if they ate too much chocolate. Um, you know, of course, and also they don't want to see if something beautiful or wonderful happened either. They want you to watch the show. And then the next one. Uh, this is from the more recent series. It was called Hope Dies Last which is about the idea that dancers have so much uh, personal strength. And I couldn't understand how they have so much personal strength with all the adversity that it takes to be a successful classical dancer. Um, and I started a series of interviews in Russia in 2015. I interviewed about 15 dancers uh, and I asked them what their mother told them not to do. Um, and there's something very universal about mothers. The thing that, uh, that uh, my mother might say might be something that your mother might say or your best friend's mother might say. And they all told the dancers the same thing. Don't drink too much. Uh, don't smoke. Don't get a giant tattoo, which is this. Don't eat too much Nutella. Don't play with guns. Uh, there's a long list of what you're not supposed to do. So this was a series about going into your imagination about what you're not supposed to do. And of course, you can't see the dancer's face. And I don't believe a dancer has a giant uh, Matryoshka tattoo like that. Um, but the idea is you're really looking at her business. Yeah. Um, and she doesn't know that you're looking except for that uh, shadow. 
Yeah, that's interesting. The, um, the next piece is the studies. Oh, these were done this year, believe it or not. It's a series called Quarantine Nudes. And uh, we've had all kinds of different restrictions and curfews here in Florence. But one of the things uh, you were, at some point you were allowed to have another person come to your home, uh, our studio, but you weren't, uh, we still had to do social distancing. So I suggested the model keep on her uh, mask and gloves because this was at the beginning. And I guess it's asking a question about what is, what is a nude? Well, this, is a funny, still... this is a funny one. And this is, you know, when I look at your sense of humor, all right, which I think has always been a part of your work. I mean, this is one of the things that I know when you were young that I think that your work stood out with a, 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 a sense uh, of humor that I think we had discussed when you went off to college, what, what would happen at college, particularly because of this sense of humor. But um, the, uh, the interesting thing here is that it is humorous. Here's the, uh, the mask and the gloves, but no clothes. You know? Yeah, well, it, it asks a couple of other questions also, such as, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the easiest way to say this, is where have we come in the, in the history of art? Mm -hmm. um, how much, how much uh, has changed? And I think I could accept this as a, as a nude, but I think a lot of people would say, well, she's not nude at all. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you did a series of studies and then, and that's how you work. So this gives people an understanding of where I am start. I'm currently working on larger scale pieces with the same theme, including a couple of nudes showing up at a cocktail party. I've played with the theme called the emperor's new clothes uh, quite a bit. It's a theme that's come by the last 20 years in my work. And it's about the idea of uh, oftentimes that you'll see a nude in the painting in a, in a cocktail party. Um, but really I paint what you see, which is people standing there's the floor and the wall and people and what people are thinking about. And maybe someone's thinking they wore the wrong shoes and everybody's staring at them. Mm -hmm. uh, you've always heard that expression, I feel as if I was naked. Now, of course the person was wearing clothes, but that's how they felt. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to paint what you see, but also what people feel. Um, this is all very easy to do in a book. If you're a writer, you can explain what happened in the past, the present and how everybody feels. Um, it's very easy to do in a movie because you can do flashbacks. You can zoom in on what you have the attention. But painting is a very unusual medium because it does not have any sense of time. There's no chronology in a painting. The painting is the same right now as it will be in 200 years. Um, uh, usually a painting doesn't have an exploding bus. It doesn't have a movie star. Um, usually there's no kissing. Um, uh, so you've got a lot of limitations on how to tell your story because you have to tell the story without anything happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so this raises questions, how do you create or build a painting that people will connect with um, in a medium that's very familiar and that doesn't even move? Yeah, and you know, uh, as a figurative painter, I mean, you could have chosen, like you said, you paint still lifes and, and figures. Uh, you also paint landscapes as well. But the thing is that, um, you know, your um, the strength of your work, I think, is what we feel as a personal interpretation, because uh, we all feel the same kinds of things. And I think you you're able to communicate that in your work in a, in a special way. This is your series of still lives. Right. I did a show recently that we had a solo show that was in Miami. Uh, it was called um, Fresh Tomatoes. And sometimes the things you want to paint are just the most, the most simple things. One thing that's in common with all of my work is what people are thinking that they're afraid to say. And one of the things that people often think about is something that you and I call temptation. And in art history, they would call it the, the seven deadly sins. You know, these are things that you are not supposed to do. The 10 commandments are a partial list. You're not supposed to steal. You're not supposed to kill. You're not supposed to covet your neighbor's wife. There's a long, there's a long list. Um, but ultimately, maybe you want to do this or do that. And one of the nice things about painting a tomato or Nutella is it's just something we want. Almost everybody wants a beautiful tomato. When, um, I, when, when I go to your place and I've been in your studio, you always have bowls of tomatoes. Some artists will have flowers, all right? 
but you have you tend to have bowls of tomatoes. The, I, 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 the simplest way to say it, I think, each tomato is a miracle. Each tomato, tomato is a new world. And actually that's how I paint tomatoes as well as I do, besides having some practice experience and painting from life real tomatoes, is that each time I look at a tomato and I'm about to paint it, I think I have never seen a tomato. I am one year old or I'm zero years old. I was just popped out. I was just born. And this is the first time I've seen a tomato. What does it look like? What color is it? What shape in a sculptural form are those little green leaves? How round is it? Um, uh, what does it reflect the colors of, of what it's sitting on? I try and look at it as if I never saw it before. And I think that a lot of times that's something that holds a lot of painters back, especially when you're starting is you kind of, uh, you're a little too casual in that you don't take the time to, to really look. You kind of say, oh, well, the tomato's round, I'll make it round. The tomato is green, I'll make this green. And I think when you really observe, you'll tell a more compelling story. If you listen to love songs, whether it's uh, Elvis Presley's Suspicious Minds or, uh, or Justin Bieber, um, you know, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the, the most recent song, but, but they have specific people in the songs. It's the brown eyed girl or it's the so-and-so. And these specific details are necessary me and Bobby McGee by Chris Christopherson. Um, these specific details are necessary to tell a universal story. And if you want to talk about the, you know, the first apple that Eve ate, then you better look at that tomato um, and use the specific ideas, I, uh, the specific details to tell that big story. Yeah. And then uh, the signature, uh, one of the signature pieces that you're uh, well known for is your Nutella. So here's your Nutella and your tomato together. Well, everybody loves Nutella. And it's, uh, you can't paint uh, bad Nutella. Who doesn't want some Nutella? It's just a, a pleasant image. If I paint the floor or I paint, uh, I don't know, the top of a table or a wall or something, you're not going to be very interested. You're not going to get much attention. But if I paint Nutella, it's something pleasing for almost uh, everyone. This particular Nutella I found in Tulum, Mexico, and it actually did say gracias on the label. And I thought that was very thoughtful because um, uh, that's something that's a, it's a very popular theme in yoga and some other cultural movements about this idea that we should be grateful uh, for what we have, that we should show gratitude and that we should, um, we should focus on what we do have that's good rather than focus on all the things that we're missing and that we lack. Yeah, the uh, and this would this be considered a study? Yes, definitely a study for a big painting, which oh. has never been painted. Yeah, and then uh, here's another one, which I just think you never that, show up. Maybe some minions are going to show up. <laughs> They're happy about your <laughs> palette too. Um, the uh, and then here are here's you in the uh, on one of your trips. So it gives people an idea of how you're working with your landscape. This was one of the last, uh, I think this is what last slide or the second to last one. This was a, a visit, a trip, my first trip to Japan. And I was very, this, the Buddha in the background is over 800 years old. It's called, I'm sorry, it's from the year 800. Uh, it's called the Great Buddha of Kamakura. And uh, I managed to be able to sit on the very early morning and paint it from life. And uh, be, besides, uh, something that has, uh, that's been inspiring people for you know, 1500 years. Um, I really like the uh, idea. I thought it kind of uh, emphasized that it's important to go out and uh, get what you're looking for. As I said, you have to have a, uh, you have to want uh, and strive to do it. And if you have to go travel to Japan, I went on a, on a, public train by myself. It was a five hour trip. I couldn't speak any Japanese besides, you know, the word uh, sushi and a few other greetings and things like that. And managed to get onto the side of the Buddha with my uh, paints and I brought some snacks. And I had that time and I, I, I gifted this particular painting uh, to my parents. Um, 
who I hope will enjoy it, but it, it just shows you that you can live your dreams instead of just standing on the sidelines. And that's what I would encourage you to do, whether living your dreams is make a good still life this morning or whether it's uh, you know something much more uh, large and, and divine. Yeah, and now we're gonna end because we're uh, getting close to that time. Let me um, uh, stop sharing and just say, uh, there are a couple of things that I wanna to add to this uh, um, is that uh, I remember a call that I got from you one time that said that you were in a group show. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you said you were in a group show with Boris Petrov, Zhao Li, and uh, I think Giovanni Rossi. Yeah, Giovanni Rossi, sure. Yeah, Giovanni Rossi. And uh, I thought, yeah, this, and you wanted to know what, what how should you should be in this show? How, how are you gonna work with these, these other three artists? Well, everybody needs to know that, um, <laughs> Those three artists actually uh, were you too, right? <laughs> Which is <laughs> I'll never admit it. Yeah. So it's it's interesting yeah. the um, you know uh, the, your personality and honestly working with you over the years, uh, I'm uh, it's a gift to me to be your friend and uh, honestly enjoy our company and you know we're really close and now having you as part of the uh, the Yellow Barn faculty. You know, the Yellow Barn's meant a lot to me because I started it years ago. But honestly, now having you uh, come and return and uh, teach, we really want to get you students. So I think this is where we are at this point. Uh, do you want to say anything else before we end? I just want to say thank you, because uh, I think that uh, there's nothing that can make a bigger difference, uh, no matter how talented you are, no matter how driven you are. Uh, no matter how many lucky breaks you get, no matter how many good things happen, there's not much you can do if not in the early uh, period of your development that you don't have a great teacher. And without you getting a big ego, uh, you have been uh, that great teacher. That was 35 years ago that I was at Whitman before everybody gets teary-eyed. Um, I just want to say thank you. And if no other reason, what I want to teach at the Yellow Barn is just simply that you asked me. That's enough. Yeah, and, and it's great. It's great having you today. I uh, want to say thank you to everyone who's watching this uh, video. Hopefully you'll, um, you know, think about taking uh, Kevin's class. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, hope to see you soon.